All right. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. Right before I started to turn on the Zoom, my dog woke up. He's normally a late riser, but he decided he had to go to the restroom. So I had to let the little man out. That's all right. We'll get it going. Okay. So for the day, first thing, as always and as usual, first thing we want to do is check what's going on in the uh, market watch tab. So if you're kind of new to Thinkorswim, a lot of people, you know, they, they get hung up on uh, how to be able to find things here. Think of the market watch uh, as a couple of sets of menus. And once you start getting used to think or swim this way, being able to find things will become a lot easier. So that would be the menu bar one, and then you drop down into the next menu bar two. And then from there, you know, you even have an opportunity for a third menu bar. But think of it that way, and it's a lot easier. So go to market watch, go to the calendar, and here is the events of today that we got to deal with. Now, Think or Swim doesn't rank these. So if you're kind of newer to trading and you need a little bit of assistance on which one of these could be impactful or, you know, are, are expected to be impactful, there's a lot of places out there you can go to. I don't, I don't want to say that there's, you know, the right one or the wrong one. I've always just used FX Street economic calendar it's free you don't have to sign in or sign up uh, they do have a thing where you can you know like create a free account don't give them your real email address these guys will bomb you with emails non-stop it's it's almost harassment um, sometimes this right here is a good read first thing in the morning it can kind of offer you a little bit of perspective on the dollar and I I talk about that constantly about how we're you know a lot of us are not economists and when we're looking at a move in the dollar trying to figure out you know is that strong dollar a good thing is it a bad thing where did it come from why is the dollar moving if you can find a consistent narrative from you know a, a trusted source that can help you understand what's going on in the dollar take it right I usually go to uh, Finvin FinBiz Pro and read over there on the dollar. You can also do, you know, trading view. They do a, a pretty good one. Can't see on the Zoom. Hey, thanks for the heads up, buddy. Let me see what's going on on the Zoom. All right, that should get you. I don't know. That should have done it. Anybody else got an issue with Zoom this morning? Can't see the screen. Can't hear me. Yes, no. Keith, some feedback. All right, there you go. So if you can't see it, Keith, it's on you, bud. Everybody else seems to be all right. So today, these are the things that are coming out. Like I said, this can give you an impact expectation. The darker the color, the higher the impact expected. And just because there's an expectation of something going wrong or of a big move, it doesn't mean we're actually going to get one, right? And there's been times where it says it's really sleepy, like we're not expecting anything to happen and then some big drastic move happens. So you know, always take that with a little bit of, of uh, caution 
all they're doing here is saying in the past, this has been known to cause, you know, violence or volatility within the market. That That's a really good way of kind of checking it out. I've, I've used FX Street for a long time. I'm comfortable with it. it. I like it. But I've heard people mention other places that are just as, you know, just as good. Um, on TradingView, they have those community, I don't know what they call them, channels, I guess where if you find a, you know, a good, uh, a good source for the dollar, you could do that. Or even stock twist has a, a pretty decent community that goes through and kind of talks about the dollar. It's not the idea that we can't do technical analysis on the dollar, right? That that's not the issue. It's, it's more about trying to understand why it's moving. Cause sometimes the dollar is, is like global VIX. And then other times, you know, it's like risk on. So I was like chasing the squirrel down a rabbit hole. All right. So we got our economics for the day. 8.30, 10, 1, and 2. The 2 o'clock is where the fixed incomes, fixed income market is going to close today. You know, most of us retail traders are not involved in, in the bonds of Apple or the bonds of Facebook, right? We're not, we're not setting into fixed income and doing bonds. We're just trading the stock. But... Um, the lack of market when something closes is you know, we, we want to be aware of it, right? And I mean, you can see what's been going on in the overnight hours. There's nothing going on, right? There's, there's just like nobody home. It's very dangerous in an environment like this. And it comes down to the, the reason it's so dangerous is there's a lack of liquidity, right? A, in the overnight hours or when there is a lack of liquidity, Markets can make big moves because a smaller player can make price move a lot farther. I heard the phrase performance chasing yesterday, and it really fit, right? That a lot of the names that were bid up and moving yesterday were names that were up on the year, uh, at least as good as the S&P, right? Because you know, if you're a fund manager or a portfolio manager and you go to send out your year end statements and it shows you're holding a bunch of junk that couldn't even do as good as the S&P, their clients have to ask, like, why am I using you, man? I, I can just go buy SPY and get better returns than the junk you're buying. And so a lot of the stuff that was down was already down or was going to be ending the year, you know, less than the performance of the S and P and things that were up yesterday were things that were doing as good or better than the S and P makes sense. We could even see more of that again today. Now I heard that somewhere, right? I don't want someone thinking that I'm taking credit for somebody else's analysis or perspectives. I didn't notice that it was brought to my attention. So you know, just, just kind of think about that again today. As we watch things unfold today, look at what's moving and look at what's not moving and check its year-to-date percentage. Is it up on the year at least as good as the S&P? The volume that you're looking at down at the volume at the bottom of my screen is turned off for the intraday. There's no intraday volume. It's only nighttime volume. Look at the nighttime volume since Friday. Right, so Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, here we are Thursday. What volume? It is in there. It's just very, very light. Right? It's very light, so be very careful out there. There's nothing wrong with not trading at all. Right? Just, just doing something else. Using it for a, a learning day. It is a zero day again today. So I'm hoping to get, you know, just... A couple dollars, no big deal. The zero days are a chance to, um, I don't know, make a car payment. You know, it, we're not swinging for the fences, just trying to capture a little bit of a little bit of gains. Um, I tend to do the zero days after I'm already done trading in the futures, and I'm done in the futures by 8 a.m. So I don't even, I don't even need to catch a move on the intraday. But you know, I mean, when they offer really great opportunities, yeah. Come back and get some of that too. 
If you're going to day trade, you may as well day trade something that was designed to be day traded, like the futures. Options were never designed to be day traded. We do it. We hijack them and we use them for that, but futures are a better vehicle to use if you're going to day trade. So speaking of day trading, we've got an average daily range in the ES of 1.77 or 1.8%. And right now we're only up a quarter of a percent. So there is the expectation that this could continue to uh, move through the morning. We also have a market maker move of another 20 cents, 20 percent, excuse me, 0 0.20. So, you know, when, when you put those together, it's almost a $100 expected move on the day. But let's look at it another way, right? We actually have a, a more current expected move than that rather than using a 20 day average and then rather than adding in the market maker move we can just come in and say you know how much does this have left to move what's the expectation of movement so there is the zero day that's today has a 19 dollar expected move basically a 20 dollar expected move between now and the end of the day now that's the es futures and a lot of you don't trade futures so let's go to spy and ask the same question how much room is this expected to move in the next couple of hours? Because at four o'clock, that's the week end. So what do you got? A $2.70 expected move from its current location of 469. So another 270 on top of that. And it has a market maker move of $1.80. So you can add that $1.80 to the 270, right? That puts us at a $4 expected move from our current location. If you're buying out of the money calls or buying out of the money puts, use $4 away from the money, right? Uh, SPY has an average daily range right now of 0.4. That doesn't sound right. All right, let's see if this give us something better. 1.8, that sounds right. 1.4, so a 1.5% average daily range. The average daily range is counting back the last 20 candles and just asking a very simple question. How far is this moved on a day-to-day -day ba basis on average in the last 20 days? About a dollar, or excuse me, about one and a half percent. Okay. Right? It's, I mean, that, that sounds pretty good. In the last five days, the average trading range has been seven and a quarter dollars, not percent. 680? 720. So it's been, you know, in the last five days, it's really been increasing. It's these really big candles, right? It's that volatility we keep talking about. What I'm getting at is the market is pricing in a big move today. So, you know, lack of volume or no lack of volume, this thing still has the potential to move. And it may not be exactly what you think it, it's going to be. Don't try to, you know, Bet it all on red. Play what you got. We've got some resistance at 47.11. That's a cog line, by the way. Always keep in mind the cog lines, 47.11. Uh, if we get there, first test will be a pullback play. That's, you know, that's day done right there. One single shot and you're, you're already done for the day. You can go do something else. Uh, we do have, you know, this higher one up here. I really don't think we're going to make that. Let's measure it and even see if it's possible to go that far with the, uh, yeah, it's, it's a 1% move, right? We can make a 1% move today. It fits within the ADR. So keep your eye on 4744, 4745. Because that's going to be first test rejection play too. You know, that's another day done opportunity. To the downside, if the market happens to not like the economic news that comes out this morning, we'll look to breach the Globex low pivot of yesterday at around 78. The bottom of that thing, which is around 61. And then we'll deal with the five minute open range top from yesterday, which kind of fits into that last Globex pivot point. Again, looking at a move that deep, you know, and thinking, well, can we even go there? Is it is it within the boundaries of our expected move? 
yeah, it's a one and a quarter percent, you know, where we would give back the 0.32 and then make another uh, 1% to the downside well within boundaries. Now, there are these dotted lines before we could get there. The red line that you see here, that's yesterday's high. The thin black line, which may be a little harder to see, that's where we closed at 5 o'clock when the Globex in, uh, regular trading ended. The purple is a floor pivot. Floor pivot calculation comes into play, right? High, low, close, divided by three. That's like the third missed daily pivot in a row, by the way. Then we've got the 10-period daily moving average, 20-period daily, and uh, the 50-period daily. And then, of course, that darker green line is yesterday's lowest value. Institutional pivot points, right? High, low, close using a floor pivot, which is calculating those high, low, close. If you're thinking of floor pivots, you know, the, the easiest way to, to, to get the nerd out of that and just understand it in layman's terms, it's yesterday's average price. So if somebody is buying this market today, they are paying more than yesterday's average price. Nice, short, simple, sweet, makes perfect sense. No nerd required, right? Don't have a, don't have to have a science degree. Understand that one. VWAP is very similar to the same concept, right? It's not the same, just similar. Average price, only it, it uh, involves volume, right? Yesterday's average price, average price. Both of these, by the way, are universal indicators. That means that you can't break them. You can't get them wrong. And if you're really new, you can't screw it up. You could literally know nothing about the market, put it on any time frame that you want. It's still going to give you the same number as it would give a professional. You don't have to adjust any settings. You don't have to worry about whatever time frame. It's the same. Right? It's universal. Everybody sees the same one. Unlike a moving average, for an example. We got the same situation here in the NASDAQ. Very, very tight range. Starting to expand a little bit. Aggregating. The purple line is the floor pivot. And again, it's a missed pivot. MDP, missed daily pivot. It's like multiple now. I don't even know how many we have in a row unless we go and turn it on. So we'll just kind of look back. Uh, that's the second one right? This is the beginning of the rally up. This was our first missed daily pivot. And so far today, this is the next missed daily pivot. When it comes to trading strategies, um, I'm a big fan of naming my strategies, but some of them are already named like this, the MDP, red to green MDP, trend line breakover, inside day, inside day breakouts. Those are all known strategies pretty common, pretty popular named strategies that you can do a lot of research on. Some of them are even in books that were written back in the 70s and the 80s. So when I, I start to zoom out a little bit, the continuity of this starts to really show up, right? You see how that orange line well, that's the 50 period moving average. The green line is the 20 period and the blue. So that by the time we come out to a daily and we were to turn on something like just some moving averages, there's your 20 and there's your 50 off of the daily. So we want to plot these daily moving averages on the intraday so that we can see them and so that we don't have to keep coming out to the daily and looking at them. That's where that straight orange line is or the straight green one or the blue one. And now that I've turned it on, this 15 minute chart has a 20 period, 15 minute and a 50 period. 15 minute. 
they're curved. They look like normal moving averages. That's how you know you're on the right time frame for those. Yeah, simple, easy. So in the NASDAQ, if we are to break through this level to the upside, One point five percent from our current location would put us at a one point seven five. We've got an ADR of two point three, so that is well within our boundaries. We can reach that high. If we get there, we're very likely to take at least one rejection, right? So first touch rejection play, that's day done right there. You get get that one in the Nasdaq. It's a twenty five point play. You're done. Right? You made twenty five points. You go do something else which means that all these other miners are within reach. Uh, should we break to the downside? Instead of going to the upside, we'll deal with the Globex low, which kind of puts us on par for this pivot point back here at the same time. Then another one at the 42 channel. And pivot back down here at around the 86 channel or the 86 pivot minor. Just to check and see if it's within our boundaries. So 1.4, we got an ADR of 2.3. We can easily make that move. Now, granted, 12 hours plus are already done. So, you know, we're running out of time, but we do have economic events. We're expecting a continuation of that performance chasing today to a point, right, to a degree. Um, you got to kind of want to keep that in mind. You know, that that Baker rig, Hughes, the rig count, I'm not expecting anything out of that. I'd really want to keep my eye on, you know, the, uh, the two o'clock close for the fixed income markets. But, you know, even that sometimes is just, the fact that they're turning something off and that, that there's a lack of participation, but we've already got a lack of participation. So that's not, you know, expected to be much on that one, right? At three o'clock when the bonds close, for an example, or at three o'clock when the dollar closes, a lot of times they close and, and we see nothing, right? It's like, okay, they closed and yeah, uh-huh, nothing, right? So it's, it could very likely and very possibly going to be the same thing with the fixed income markets. In fact, most of you are probably sitting there thinking, I don't even know what the heck that fixed income market is. You're not even going to notice that it closed. We had a pretty decent move in the dollar yesterday, and then it finally uh, stabilized and rallied up. That rally up in the latter part of the day in the dollar really didn't give us anything right between four and five. Our markets are still open. We just don't trade them. Most of the futures retailers their brokers won't let them trade past four, uh, but the markets are open until five now in the futures. So while the retailers are out of it, the other players are still there and they get to run it until five. Futures are actually closed from five to six. Otherwise they're open. Yeah, and we've seen this move in the dollar. We really didn't see anything out of it. So the bonds have tagged that high and faded back off. We really want to see them maintain today. It's not the idea of which way they're going. It's the idea of that they're not going to make big moves, right? We don't want to see these big, sharp swings, big monster candles, big plays. Just nice, subtle, easy grind. No extremes. That's what we're looking for, right? No extremes. Nice, calm, and easy. With the zero day today, that means we can trade basically anything with a weekly option. There was contract change, by the way, in the VIX. That's what this is all about. So I have, uh, had someone asking about that the other day. What's up with that big gap? Futures contract change. Notice where the money is at this morning. That's the Dow. 
as the Russell. So I was talking with somebody yesterday and I built a watch list of companies that have weekly options and are also less than $10. And I honestly was surprised by how many names were on the list and how many names I recognized on that list. So the reason I bring this up is if you're finding it difficult to trade right now, and you're, you're not comfortable being a day trader, for an example, and you, and you want to try to do some swing trading, think about selling options. I know it, it's not sexy and it's kind of boring, but it has a high win rate. It's easily defendable and it's dependable, right? Not only can you, does it have a great defense, it has a lot of dependability behind it. So that way, even though you're not actively using a lot of your capital in you know, some momentum trades and trend trades, you're still growing that account and you're actively participating in the market, meaning you're getting better at what you do, right? You're honing your craft. Obviously, these are cheap names. They're less than $10. You're not going to make a fortune on this unless you size up, right? And put a lot of them on, but you would be able to learn in a market where it's cheaper. And if you're in a small account, these cheaper ones are your sweet spot. Right. So we're talking about selling puts. And then if you end up with stock or if you take stock, then you rotate over to the other side and do the calls. Right. Like the wheel strategy. When you add Jade Lizard to that, you can get some really decent uh, credit. And everything's got a real high implied volatility right now. I have this list sorted by its volatility. And so there is some really nice volatility out there. Again, this is really cheap markets. You're not you're not going to make big money. But once you learn how to do the strategy and you apply it to something else like Baba or Roku or whatever, it doesn't matter, right? Big names. Then you're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. And all you're doing is drawing a line saying, I bet you won't fall lower than this. Isn't that a heck of a lot easier than trying to say, I think you're going to go this far in X amount of days? To be able to just draw a line and say, I bet you don't fall lower than that. And then if it actually does fall lower than that, you take the stock and flip it over to the other side or you kick the can down the road. You don't ever actually have to take the stock. Right. Short, simple, sweet, easy. And it's another way to stay engaged to make money in an environment where maybe you don't want to go out and buy a bunch of stock. My uh, 20 year fidelity plan is sitting on the sideline, for an example. That thing isn't doing anything. In 13 months, I grew that $500 into a $7,800. That's not bad returns for a little $500 account in 13 months. But it's not making any returns now when it's sitting on the sideline in cash. Doing something like this in there would at least get it engaged and be making some kind of money while we're waiting for a, a a more decent market. Okay. So something to think about. Take advantage of the high implied volatility right now. Why not? All right. You can see those airlines are still moving around and the list for the weekly options. The reason that there are two lists is because there are 600 names and TrendSpider won't let me make one watch list with 600 names in it. So I broke the list in half. You can see that there are plenty, plenty of names that are on the move this morning. So, you know, last day before Christmas, short holiday week, whatever there's still a lot of things out there that we can trade and that are making moves i would be focused on any kind of wedge play trend line break over red to green setup right we're talking about you know bear flag failure bear pennant failure 
add to a red to green with a trend line break or inside day play. Those uh, tie in really nice with what they call machine gun pivots or, you know, the, the time frame continuity style of trading. So that, you know, in a situation like this, for an example, if we did happen to start breaking out of this range, think about where the stops are at for the short traders. You know, if someone had shorted on this day, their stop would, you know, for an example, be at the high of that. Or if they shorted on this day, their stop would be at the high of that or this one at the high of that. Well, once we start breaking through those, triggering all of their stops, if they're short, their stops are a buy, right? They've, they've got a buy to close and that fuels the buy and the it's just a squeeze, right? It just pops them right up through. That's why we get those 4% moves a lot of times on those trend line breakover plays. So that would be my go-to today. Trend line breakovers, red to greens, preferably at the bottom of a range. Looking to see something open near the high of yesterday's open from a red to green would be even better. Look for how much they are up on the year. Um, you have to set your chart to a percentage. Right, but that's not a big deal. On Thinkorswim, you can just go to style, show price as percentage. If you don't have that in your style drop down menu, then go to the gear icon and go to time axis. I think I told you wrong. Go to price axis and click show price as percentage this little arrow right there is going to put it in the menu for you so once you've got that arrow clicked and you hit apply and okay now when you go to style you'll see it there so that you don't have to go through all those steps next time you can just do it from right here right you're adding to your menu i know right i should do classes on think or swim no I'm not going to do that. We've got a nine video series, by the way, if you want some, some classes on Thinkorswim. Just watch those videos. So, you know, if the S&P is up year to date, 27 and a quarter percent, then look at the names that are up at least that much or better. Like Ford, maybe. 125 percent or google almost 70 percent uh things like intel which are not even close to being up being able to beat spy year to date All right, so I mentioned the airlines. Chip names. MU, NVIDIA, AMD, ADI. You know, most of them are in the green. Remember, they need to be up at least like a, a half of a percent, right? If they're If it's less than that, I really don't consider it that that aggressive or that bullish in the morning. Some crypto names. Remember that my crypto list is not necessarily coins, right? It's more about companies that are involved in blockchain or companies that are uh, highly leveraged into the crypto market.
Financials and energy have been tightly correlated this year. With the moves in the bonds and the dollar, this may be worth keeping an eye on today. This, you know, financial sector and the energy sector. One thing I like about both of those sectors is they have some cheaper names to play in, right? $30 and $50 companies with nice liquid options. They're tradable, they're active. They, you know, these, these companies can really make some moves great things to trade when it comes to zero day however these zero day plays i really like trading big stuff google amazon tesla the spx the ndx i like those really big names because when you go in and put on a credit spread that is going to expire today that literally means you're the credit you're collecting at your pay you're going to get that today by the end of the day so when you go in and you make these things 50 points wide at the money, you're making $1,700 credit today. And of course, we don't run that to the close, right? We aim from 35 to 55% profit. I've closed zero day trades that I've opened at 935. I've closed them by 1015 in the morning at better than 35, 45% profit. You don't have to hold these through the day. You get a good push at the open and a, a credit spread that you've opened today at the money can be more than 35% profit just like that. So, you know, it's um, I do these at the money because the risk is less, right? Of course, going farther out of the money, you're going to win more frequently but you're putting a lot more cash at risk. This trade, for an example, is risking $450 to make $50. And this one will win a lot, right? This one will win 93% of the time. But I don't, I'm not here to win. I'm here to make money. And when this does lose, oh man, it hurts. It hurts really, really bad. And by the time you realize that it is losing, you're already really deep in the hole because this will go negative long before price ever gets to you. It'll go negative as soon as we drop below, say, 46.95. This thing will be in the hole and you'll be upside down and, and losing already. So then you're thinking, well, you know, we're still above my break even. I really shouldn't close it yet. This could easily turn around. And then by the time it does get to you, you're at like, more than two thirds max loss, and you're taking a massive loss, and it sucks. So, yeah, this will win more frequently, but you won't make any money 40 freaking dollars. You're putting a lot of money at risk $450, and it just sucks. Now, you do that same trade at the money, now you're getting $125, so you're risking $375 to make $125, and I get it. Hey, that, that's not one to one, right? but it's the SPX and you rarely get a one-to-one -one in the SPX. You do that in Amazon or Google or Microsoft, you're gonna see that one-to-one -one more frequently. This has a greater chance of losing, right? Because you're at the money, you actually need price to do something now. It needs to get off the bench, get into the game and, and move for you to be profitable. But one, it doesn't have to move very far. Two, you're risking less money. Three, you're making more money. Right, And this has a 55% chance of winning just from the numbers. We haven't even talked about, well, if I get in at support, my win rate goes up. That probability has no idea where price is at. It doesn't know if you're at support or resistance. It doesn't know if you're at the end of the day or not. It just has your delta probabilities. So, you know, an at-the-money credit spread on a zero day has the chance of losing more often. You actually have to perform a little bit of technical analysis and time your trade with the market. But you'll make more money and you have less money at risk. And I'm not talking right or wrong here. I trade out of the money stuff just as much as I trade at the money. I just don't blindly go out and build stuff way out there. And when we're talking size, you size up here, you're still 
trying to keep those numbers as close to a one-to-one -one as you can. This isn't, of course, right? Because we're $50 wide and I don't have $25 credit. So I'm not one-to-one -one and close. There's $2,000 credit. Close a trade like this down in 45 minutes for a thousand dollars profit. Yesterday, when we were running these trades, because yesterday was a zero day, we had the call credit spread up here, and we later added a put credit spread down here. Because why not? I mean, you know, we weren't doing anything, may as well get paid for both sides, and so we had two credit spreads that were expiring down here, one that was up here. And, you know, we, we made a couple hundred bucks. No big deal. It, we didn't size up. Uh, just kept it, you know, nice and nice and low. Closed both of those profitably, by the way. So when it comes to your zero days um, roll up, I didn't have to close these. I, uh, I could have rolled up, but I was busy, so I, I didn't. Once it started to rally off of these lows, this was an $80 credit spread. I had $80 in credit. Could have rolled that closer to the money, just moving it up the chain for an additional $80 of credit, especially once we broke back through that range right in there. All right, so it's taking the trade that you already have, just rolling it up for more credit. If you had started the day with that put credit spread down here, and then it ran like a mad demon and stalled out up here, That'd be to take that credit spread and roll her up. Even if you want to start way out of the money, like we were talking about, suppose you do start way out here. You're $10 wide. You know, you're out of the money at a 12 delta or a 20 delta. And then the market pops at the open, starts to run. You get this trade. You start rolling it up. Well, every time you roll closer to the money, you get more credit. So you may start out far away with just a little bit of credit. And then as it's proving you right, roll it up, make more money, get that risk out of that thing. Get more money. Uh, start small. If you're new to this stuff, trade small, trade often is, is like the catchphrase. The XSP is the same product. SPY is not the same product, right? SPY is a man-made ETF. It's weighed. It's not constantly weighed. They got to go in and make adjustments to it. This is the micro version, the mini SPX, penny to penny perfect. It's just one tenth the size. Cash settled, no assignment risk. Do that. Or do the new NDX, the micro NASDAQ. Right? The, uh, what is the, that new one? It's so new, even forget the, the little acronym for it XND. So this sucker can move. These are great things to trade, much smaller risk, right? Get familiar with the system, the strategy. You get your trade setups. You perfect your art in a market like this, then size up. Google is expected to continue to do good today. Not Amazon, right? Because Amazon isn't beating S&P right now. So, you know, when we're talking about performance chasing, Amazon doesn't fit. This does. Look for a continuation play in Google today. And first touch rejection, I'm going to probably play a short here. Just, you know, uh, scalp some puts to the downside. Other than that, zero day long, right? And when I buy those puts on that rejection, I'm going to be using the credit that I collected in my credit spreads to pay for that sucker. That way, if I'm wrong and it doesn't first touch reject at that point, those puts don't lose me any money. They're covered with the credit that I collected from the put credit spread. Yeah. Yeah. For Amazon, since we're not expecting it to uh, be a part of the performance chasing today, then running something like the 3460 or the 3480 after it's proven to stay inside of yesterday's range. Right. So first touch fail, 
credit spread on top. That may even give you an opportunity to leg into a zero-day iron condor, kind of like what we had yesterday. If it rejects here and it's staying in the range, try to uh, add one underneath on the put side. Now you've legged in. If you do that correctly and you're building them at the money, you can actually get a no-risk trade. This means as long as it stays in the middle, you make money. And if it breaks to either side, you just don't make money, but you don't lose. I like the situations where I either don't make money or I make money, but I don't lose money. Those are good situations to be in. The legacy names are expected to continue to be good today. That'll be your Microsofts, your Apples. Because those institutions or those fund managers, they're not going to cash, right? They're, there's penalty there for them to go to cash. So they're getting out of their junk, BABA, Intel, things that aren't even beating the S&P, and they're immediately rotating into something else. Where are they going? Into the legacy names, your mega cap names. So what I got for you guys, be careful, be safe, have a good one, and I will see you all next week.